Week two, week two, NFL, what you gonna do, brother? All right, so when we talk about week two, I, I know there is an adage out there, and you've heard coaches and people talk about it over the years, that week one is nice and it's great. There's the excitement of the season kicking off, the season getting underway, wanting to see kind of what your team is and what they're about, what you might be able to do, all that nervous, anxious anticipation. But to me, at least for sure, week two has always been the most important week of the early season for sure. Because in week two, you could either validate your week one performance and you've started off 2-0. and oh. You can rebound from your week one performance and be 1-1 one and one and be right back to even Steven. Or you could validate your bad performance in week one with another bad performance in week two. And all of a sudden you're sitting at 0-2 and, and only 12% of teams since 1990, I believe it is, that have started off 0-2 have actually made the playoffs. So for the vast majority of those 0-2 teams, your season is pretty much already kaput. So even that early in the year, week two, is a critically important, vital week in the NFL. And you had some big winners and you had some big losers this week. Let me go ahead and dive in and talk about who I thought were the best and the worst of the week, starting with the biggest winners. I look at the Atlanta Falcons. You're opening up that new mecca to Falcons football in Arthur Blank's vision there. Mercedes-Benz Stadium would look like an absolutely gorgeous palace of football. And the Falcons on Sunday night, after a tough game against the Bears on Sunday, which should have caused some concerns, now you've got Aaron Rodgers and the Packers rolling in. You played them twice last year. The first time in the regular season, it was a one-point win. The second time in the NFC Championship game, you blew their asses off, ran them off of the old Georgia Dome field. You know, you're wondering what Atlanta Falcons team is going to show up, and could the backers have revenge on their mind? Well, the Falcons made it clear early on that they were still clearly the superior team, and even as the Packers in the fourth quarter behind Aaron Rodgers tried to make a game of it, made it a little more interesting than maybe it should be, and you're starting to think with the Falcons, oh no, here we go again, they were able to kind of stop the bleeding and cut their losses where it was, and they ended up winning comfortably. And I thought it was a huge win at home in their new stadium for the Atlanta Falcons, and now they're sitting at 2-0, and making me look like a preseason idiot. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, after that impressive road win week one against the Patriots, now you come back home week two and you face a pretty good Philadelphia Eagles team, and in a competitive game, you get big plays out of Kareem Hunt, you get big explosive plays out of guys like Travis Kelsey, and you win and you go to 2-0. and And in that division, that's going to be really important because it doesn't seem like uh, that's going to be an easy race at all the entire year, especially based off of the performance of the Broncos in week two. I mean, they were okay week one against the Chargers, but the Chargers came back on them late and had a chance to tie it before the field goal got blocked and it cemented the Broncos' victory on that Monday night game. But week two, man, lightning delay or not, they beat the brakes off of the Cowboys. America's team, my ass. They destroyed them. The defense obliterated Zeke and Dak. The offense behind Simeon was able to move the ball consistently. And that Cowboys defense that looked so good in week one, we now found out was because the Giants offense just stinks that bad. Uh, it was a massive win for the Broncos, a quality win, arguably the best win in week two. In terms of the biggest losers, I look at the two L.A. teams. You know, you had the Rams win week one. Now you've got Washington coming in off of their week one loss. You're at home. You know, this is a chance to start off 2-0 and with two straight home games. Um Heading into a week three matchup against San Francisco on Thursday night, uh, you got to take care of business here. And they just didn't get the job done. And then you look at the Chargers playing in that soccer stadium. Here come the Miami Dolphins into town. This is your first game in the soccer stadium, your first game at home in LA. Miami, with Jay Cutler of all people, comes in to Los Angeles and beats Phillip Rivers. Unbelievable. And again, for the second week in a row, it's a missed field goal, not blocked this time, just a flat-out miss this time that leads to the Chargers not being able to win. Rough stuff. And I also look at the Seattle Seahawks. I thought they were losers this week. They look like crap in Week 1 against the Packers at Lambeau. Now you go into Week 2 against an overmatched, bad 49ers team. Divisional matchup or not, the, Fal the Seahawks excuse me, should have beat the brakes off these jokers. And they didn't. They had to battle to beat them 12-9. to nine. There are major problems for the Seahawks team right now. And you almost look at them and say, 
they're going to benefit because their division stinks. But they might only make the playoffs winning nine games because this team has issues. They have problems. And to have a San Francisco team that plays you that competitively that early in the season, that should be a major cause for concern. In terms of stars of the week, offensively I go to Tom Brady. You know, after getting outplayed, frankly, by Alex Smith in week one, he came out against Drew Brees and 30 of 39 for 447 yards and three touchdowns. He threw for over 300 yards in the first half. I mean, it looked like vintage Brady. It was a big star performance for a big, big star. And then defensively, you got to go just with the Broncos' defensive unit as a whole, whether it's a kid to leave, sitting there and take a back of pick six, or the fact that the Broncos forced Dak to throw two picks or holding Zeke to eight yards on nine carries. I mean, this was a vintage Broncos defensive performance, the type of which you would have seen out of them in the 2015 season, the one year they won the Super Bowl. This was impressive stuff, and if the Broncos consistently get this out of their defense and get anything at all out of Simeon in the offense like they did in Week 2 against Dallas, this Broncos team is going to be a whole lot scarier than I thought they were going to be heading into this season. So there you go, some of the biggest winners and losers and stars of the week. Now it's time for me to kind of bring it full circle. Let's kick off 4th and 10. While he wasn't good, he was good enough. Deshaun Watson, in his first career start for the Houston Texans on the road, leads the team to a victory over the hapless Cincinnati Bengals. And I will say this, Deshaun Watson was bad in many ways, especially as a passer. But he does bring you something different in that offense, as you saw by the 50-plus yard touchdown run at the end of the first half. It was the difference. It was the game-winning play. If Bill O'Brien and the Texans want to make the playoffs this year, they must customize their offense to Deshaun Watson and not try to customize Deshaun Watson to their offense. And as I saw so often during that game Thursday night, it felt like they were putting Deshaun Watson in positions that weren't best suited for him. And to me, the real measure of a quality coach is getting the most out of your guys and putting them in the best situations. Being stubborn is not the way to go. This is a chance to finally get the quarterback position right for this organization that hasn't been able to do so, honestly, for the previous 15 seasons. Let's just hope to God for Deshaun Watson's sake that Bill O'Brien doesn't screw it the hell up. So after two games, the Bengals have fired their offensive coordinator. Not a surprise. The next move, if their offense continues to struggle, is it's time to bench Andy Dalton. And then, once the offense still continues to struggle after that, which it probably will because this Bengals team looks like they stink, it's time, once and for all, to Mike Brown to finally bench, sack, fire Marvin frickin' Lewis. I'm not surprised that Kareem Hunt was a good fit in Andy Reid's offense in Kansas City. I thought at some point in time this year, even if Spencer Ware didn't get hurt, he was going to eventually become the lead back. But man, these first two games of the season, he is a factor back. He is a difference maker for them. And all of a sudden, you look at this Kansas City Chiefs offense with a Kareem Hunt in the backfield, Tyreek Hill outside, Travis Kelsey at tight end. You look at this team and say, man, if they had a better quarterback, this is a Super Bowl team. And I'm going to stand by that. But Kareem Hunt, in the second straight game, to open his career with a 50-plus yard touchdown, the last time that happened was 1955. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at right now your leader out of the clubhouse to win the Offensive Rookie of the Year, and it's Kareem Hunt for the Kansas City Chiefs. Impressive stuff. He is making a difference for this. Tom Brady versus Drew Brees happened on Sunday And it might be the last time we ever see these two guys square off. Who knows how much longer Tom Brady is going to play in the National Football League. Frankly, who knows how much longer Drew Brees is going to play in the National Football League. And, you know, it's one of these things where you see Tom Brady at this stage of his career still playing at such a high level on such a quality team. And then you look at Drew Brees, a guy who has meant so much to his city, to his organization, to the fan base, to his teammates, to the locker room, the community, everything for so many years. And to see Drew Brees kind of wither away and waste away while still playing at a decent level on this bad, crappy, horrible Saints team is just tragic and sad and depressing. And it's just kind of sad to think about that this is probably the last time that Tom Brady and Drew Brees are ever going to be on the same field playing a regular season NFL game against each other. 
tough break for the Panthers, even though they beat their old defensive coordinator and Sean McDermott and his Buffalo Bills at home on Sunday, uh, losing Greg Olson, your do-everything tight end for six to eight weeks, is a setback this Carolina Panthers offense and team just could not afford right now. On his way to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, this past Sunday, Antonio Gates passed Tony Gonzalez for the most touchdown receptions by a tight end in NFL history. And how great it is for all of the great things Antonio Gates has done throughout his Hall of Fame career that this momentous occasion was marked in a soccer stadium in Los Angeles. A message for Lawrence Timmons and Sua Cravens. I don't care what type of issues you're dealing with. I don't care if you got family stuff, Lawrence Timmons and Sua Cravens. You're questioning whether or not you love the game of football. You freaking are getting paid to be a professional. And it's not like you're playing 12 months of games a year. Is it really that hard to be able to compartmentalize and say for a Sunday, a few hours each week, I'm going to bring it and be the best type of player I can be that I've been preparing my whole life to be? It is absolutely, completely, totally freaking ridiculous. And honestly, at this point, to send a message, I don't care how talented these guys are, if they don't want to be there, then facilitate the request and cut their fucking asses. Suspending them, putting them on a reserve non-football list isn't good enough. This is ridiculous fucking crybaby. If all it takes to be able to beat the Cowboys 42-17 to 17, is a little bit of a lightning delay, can I ask the football gods for one request? It's that once a year, when the Bears go up to Lambeau to play the Packers, you let a little acid rain fall down, and maybe they could keep it within three points. I know we're only two weeks into the NFL season, but where I expect on one hand week one's quality of play to be substandard, it was week two, and it felt like it was every bit as bad, if not worse. And I know there's not one easy answer, but ultimately the NFL has a major problem here. And this has to be rectified, and this has to be fixed somehow, some way. Because I don't care about politics, I don't care about protests and anthems and all this other crap. But the fact is, if the product on the field continues to suck the rest of this NFL season as much as it has the first two weeks, the NFL is going to have an even bigger ratings concern than they already have, because this crap has been terrible so far. Just terrible. And my closing thought is this. Maybe there's a reason that professional football hasn't been in Los Angeles for over two decades. And where I've always understood the fascination and the obsession, frankly, with first Paul Tagliabue and then ultimately his successor, Roger Goodell, to get a team or two back into Los Angeles because of the size of the media market, because of the size of the population in place, because there had been football there previously, y'all got to do better than this. I mean, how embarrassing is it that a USC-Texas game in the Coliseum on Saturday night draws a full house to where the Rams the next afternoon in that stadium get a half-empty frickin' stadium, and between the Rams and the Chargers playing in the soccer stadium, who couldn't even sell that out because they're charging outrageous ticket prices, outrageous prices for parking, and then it's as many Dolphins fans there, there are freaking Charger fans, to the point where you're looking at Antonio Gates catching his last passes in a soccer stadium in Los Angeles, and potentially Phillip Rivers throwing his last passes in his career in a soccer stadium in Los Angeles, and those two teams combined drew fewer fans than the USC Trojans and the Texas Longhorns on a Saturday night based off of 12 years or so of previous history going back to one national title game back when Matt Leinart and Vince Young were the quarterbacks of USC and Texas respectively. The NFL wanted to make this big move to Los Angeles and by God they got what they wanted. And how embarrassing it is that this early on, you can't, in a city of 8 million or so people, get 100,000 of them to be curious enough to check out a Rams game or 30,000 of them to check out a Chargers game. If that doesn't tell you the NFL's got some issues right now, I don't know what does.